I am Marcia Civic and this is Bee Provided Conservation Radio. Today's show is about the Australian bushfires and the new book, Flames of Extinction, The Race to Save Australia's Wildlife by John Pickrell. Many may recall before COVID, and or many may not because it seems like COVID's been around for such a long time, it's difficult to remember anything before it. But anyway, many may recall that right before COVID hit, much of Australia was on fire and all of us around the world were watching the the harrowing news of the immense loss of wildlife. I interviewed John recently about his new book and his experiences with the bushfires. But first, I want to play a news clip from C-SPAN archives as Australia's Prime Minister, Scott Morrison addressed the Australian House of Representatives about the bushfires on February 4th, 2020. This year we have faced, and we are still facing, a terrible season of fire. National in scale, fires that reached our highest mountain range and our longest beaches. Fires that consumed forests, grasslands and farms, suburbs and villages. Fires that jumped rivers and highways. Fires where days became night and the night sky turned red. Fires that raged into the heavens as clouds of fire. With it all, a merciless smoke that lingered across our cities. Fires that still burn. And the smoke from burned bushland that left an oppressive tightening in our chest told us that all was not right. This is the black summer of 2019-20 that has proven our national character and our resolve. A national trauma best described by Indigenous leaders who love our land so much as a grief for the victims, a heartache for our wildlife and broken heart for the scarring of our land. These fires are yet to end and danger is still before us in many, many places. But today we gather to mourn, honour, reflect, and begin to learn from the black summer that continues. I am honoured to be speaking with author and award-winning science journalist, John Pickrell. He is the author of the recently published book, Flames of Extinction, The Race to Save Australia's Wildlife. In his new book, John shares experiences of stories of 80 conservationists, wildlife rescuers, botanists, and indigenous rangers as they work tirelessly and even risk their own lives to save the unique wildlife and plant life found in Australia. John, I am so happy to have you here today, and I was wondering if you could elaborate more on what is Black Summer and what is the significance of that name that Scott Morrison mentioned in that news clip? Yeah, so thank you. I'm glad to be here. The, in Australia, we have bushfire crises fairly regularly. You know, every couple of years, there's a particularly bad bushfire season, there, and they're often lent names. And I mean, some of the famous ones have been Ash Wednesday, Black, Black Friday, Black Saturday. But really, what marked this, the 2019 to 2020 bushfire crisis that was very different to anything previously was it, it, it wasn't named for a, you know a single day or, or a crisis that had lasted for a couple of days or a week it was named for a crisis that really had lasted for many months and that, that's why it was called black summer and it, it was it was just very very unusual in Australia to, I mean unprecedented in recorded history in Australia for a bushfire season to be so enormous, both geographically and spatially, right across Australia. There were bad fires happening in many different states simultaneously, but also temporally. I mean, really, the fires in about halfway down the eastern seaboard and kind of wet, more wet, typically tropical regions that are often so actually some of the wettest places in Australia that normally have rainforest fires started there in winter 2019. That was around August. And then the fires, you know, kind of slowly rolled all the way down the um, eastern seaboard of Australia and, you know, re- reached this kind of their zenith around sort of December, January in the southern ha- half of New South Wales and um, Victoria. 
and really the fires weren't extinguished until February or March. So they, you know, it was a rolling crisis for about six months, and and that's why it's been given this name, Black Summer. Wow. Yeah, it is. It is really scary when an entire summer or season is actually a, a fire season. Um, that, that's really scary. So in, in your book, you do concentrate on the fires that are along, you know, the eastern seaboard in New South Wales. And I was curious, is this where some of the worst fires were? I mean, the majority of the fires were concentrated in southeastern Australia. New, New South Wales really bore the brunt of that. I mean, there were fires almost along the entire eastern margin of, of New South Wales and um, then there were bad fires in, in one particular region of, of Victoria and also Kangaroo Island in South Australia and then there were kind of scattered fires in Western Australia and, and other parts of Australia but the, the majority of the fires were in New South Wales and the southeast of Australia. Hmm. I was I'm curious what your personal experience was with the uh, bushfires. When I reported the book starting in kind of February, March. I first went out in March. And of course, by the time I went out to any of these fire zones, the fires had been long extinguished. And in fact, you know, even for some time after the fires, a lot of scientists, psychologists, even park rangers couldn't get out to these sites because there's a danger of falling trees in um, in the fire grounds and the burnt areas and have to be made safe again before people can go into those areas. But, but my main experience of the fire really, the fires really was throughout December um, and into January, sort of for four or five weeks, there was just a thick smog of smoke hanging right over Sydney. There were, you know, one of the worst fires, the, I mean, two of the very big fires, the Gospers Mountain Fire and the Green Mortal Creek Fire were only a couple of hundred um, or a hundred to 200 kilometres to the west of Sydney and in, in fact I mean Sydney suburbs really go quite near to, to where these fires were and it meant that the western half of Sydney really had a, almost a ring of fire right around the, the western half of um, Sydney and so that meant throughout December um, there was just thick smoke it was very unpleasant going outside I mean December is mid-summer for us and normally people would be at the beaches but it just wasn't really possible to spend much time outside at all there was thick smoke on the beaches there was uh, the beaches were kind of covered in soot and ash along the tide line and burnt leaves that were you know blown out on the breeze into the sea and were washing back onto the beaches again and people were really just trying not to spend that much time outdoors they were they were wearing masks to protect themselves against the smoke and, you know, I, I remember I, I live right in the centre of Sydney and there were days when there were black and gum leaves kind of landing, you know, drifting on the breeze onto our balcony and ash on the balcony. And, and it, you know, there were several nights when I woke up to a kind of strong smell of smoke in my bedroom and actually, you know, wondered if there, there was um, something in the apartment, but it was just the, the smoke coming in from the outside. So, I mean, Sydney is Australia's biggest city with a population of sort of four to five million. And that's what we were experiencing sort of throughout the middle of that summer. So it was a crisis that was really hitting a lot of the population of Australia as well. It wasn't just people kind of living in less urban areas. That That is really scary. And no one really knows what like the long term damage is from smoke inhalation and and to people's health. But in fact, I mean, there, there was some there was some research uh, done in Australia on the impacts the number of people that were admitted to hospital with pulmonary conditions and other things, and, and actually the number of admissions around that time really increased. So there was a study that predicted that, you know, even though about 35 people were tragically killed directly in the fires themselves, but, but perhaps up to 300 other people were killed through respiratory conditions related to the fires that kind of weren't recorded as such over that time, but they could tell from the way the emissions and death rate had increased over that period afterwards. Really scary stuff. And there is so much doom and gloom around these stories for sure. But in your new book, you do offer a glimmer of hope by sharing inspirational stories of some of the people working really hard to save Australia's wildlife and lands. What what was your motivation to write these stories? And did you go into this book with the intention of sharing hope and inspiration? So I'm a science journalist. And in December and January, I'd been covering a lot of stories specifically about the impacts on 
ecosystems and world, like a lot of stories for international publications like Science and Nature and National Geographic and The Guardian. And so I'd covered a lot of stories on, on the ecologists and scientists and the work they were doing. And I realized during that process that there was a much bigger story to tell about these people's stories and what they'd experienced on the front line and all of the incredible work that they were doing to try and save save wildlife and species and rescue populations that were going to be engulfed by fire. But the things that they were doing to try and survey for damage and um, help populations recover after fires have passed through as well and, and it was just a much bigger story to tell but but also you know in the book I wanted to document what had happened over Black Summer and, and talk about all of the impacts to wildlife and you know there's a lot of doom and gloom and really staggering statistics and but I, I didn't I, I didn't want the book to just be you know talking about all of that very depressing stuff without giving people a sense of the more hopeful side of what was being done to help wildlife and ecosystems recover and prevent something like this from happening again in Australia. So many amazing people out there and they need a huge thank you from all of us around the world and thank you so much John for sharing their stories in your new book. And um, I also wanted to bring up, you know, it, in the news, we saw the, the plight of the koalas and kangaroos as victims of fire. And, you know, I really wanted to say what I like about your book is that you also bring to light some of the lesser known species of animals and plants that we may not know anything about here in the U.S. And, for example, the wallamai pine and the nightcap oak you talk about and and you know these are something that I would normally not think about as being endangered Um, would you be willing to share some information with our listeners about these these tree species and what you learned yeah the uh, the Wollamai Pond is an interesting example it's found in Wollamai National Park which is part of this sprawling massive wilderness area to the to the west of Sydney and it, it was discovered in a canyon in some, you know, somebody abseiled into this canyon in, in the 1990s. And uh, it's in a very remote place. There are no roads out there. And it, you really have to helicopter into the site where the Walmart, and, it, and it's actually a secret site, which I'll come on to in a minute. But this, this tree was, these unusual trees, they're kind of conic with, kind of a dark green needles and they've got sort of bubbly bubbly bark and they're they're an unusual kind of pine tree an araucaria pine that is related to monkey puzzle trees from south america and a number of other pines found in australia and some pacific island norfolk pine one of the other examples and it's a kind of tree that was only known from the fossil record until was made of, of really just about a hundred wild ind- individuals in this one canyon in the wilderness in, in 1990 and it, it was realized when scientists studied it it was kind of tree that is known from fossils that once covered the southern supercontinent of Gondwana and it dates or relatives of it date right back to the Jurassic period so it would have been a tree that was growing in, in environments where dinosaurs lived so dinosaurs may have fed on it or sort of lived in the shade of these trees and it's sort of as a living fossil, and it's really been quite an exciting discovery. And unfortunately, there's this massive Gospers mountain fire. I mean, the Gospers mountain fire, an associated fire, by the time it was extinguished in February, it was really probably the world's biggest forest fire, certainly Australia's biggest ever forest fire. It had burnt through an area about 14 times the size of Singapore. So it was, it was absolutely massive in extent and but what the the park rangers and scientists realized in december was that this grove of wallamai pines was almost certainly going to be consumed by the fire so they had to throw into action an emergency plan that they kind of had up their sleeves where they basically national park firefighters were helicoptered in every day to this canyon where the pine is and um, there was a natural spring in the canyon and they, they set up an irrigation system and they were trying to damp down the, the canyon and try and they knew that there was 
no doubt that the fire was going to pass through the canyon, but they were hoping that they could reduce the severity of the fire by increasing the moisture in the leaf litter and the trees and, and the canyon itself. And eventually the fire did sweep through at around Christmas time. And but because of this work, they, they were doing sort of flying in every day to set up this irrigation system again, because the spring would run out each day and it overfilled, it, sorry, it would fill again overnight. And they were also water bucketing from the helicopters. But they, although fire did pass through the grove and it killed some of the small trees, it didn't burn up into the canopy of the trees. And um, lots of these sort of 100, 150 um, remaining wild individuals of the Wallamai Pine actually survived the fire. So, yeah, it was kind of remarkable. I don't think there'd ever really been a sort of firefighting rescue effort for a species of that kind before. Okay, so you mentioned possibly 150 trees did survive, and is this enough for them to continue to thrive? Yes, I mean, they're they're not much worse off than they were before the fires, but of course the problem is these huge fires, the huge fires were really caused by about three years of very bad drought right across southeastern Australia, and which had sucked all of the moisture out of environments, and it meant that fires could spread much further than they could under normal circumstances, and also that they could burn normally very wet environments like rainforests and marshes that wouldn't be available for fire. So, they, I mean, these huge fires are almost certainly coming around again, and what, what scientists, park rangers and governments need to do now is think about species like the wall and pine and what measures can be put in place to protect them in the future. I mean, luckily with the wall and pine, after it was rediscovered, it was cultivated at the, the Australian, the Royal National Botanic Garden in Sydney, and it was turned into a, a tree that you can buy at garden centres. Mm-hmm. And it, in fact, um, you, you can buy it commonly in garden centres across Australia now. So many people have this tree in their garden. So it's, it's, it's unlikely to go entirely extinct, but it would be very sad given that, you know, these are just it's this last remnant population of a variety of tree that's been around for hundreds of millions of years. It would be very sad if they went extinct in the wild. So people really need to think now about what measures can be put in place to protect these species in the future. And I, I think the other species you mentioned was the nightcap oak, which that's in northern yeah. Wales up in the rainforest. And again, it was a tree that's critically endangered. There were just a few hundred individuals in the wild. And it's in a rainforest environment that really has no recent history of fire at all. But the drought was so unusual running up to 2019 the heat waves in august summer of 2019 to 20 were so bad that confluence of heat and dry made the rainforests available to burn in a, in a way that had never been known to australia and fire again did pass through the graves where these ancient nightcap oaks were found and uh, i mean some of those trees have been taken in to captivity now to start a captive breeding program for, tr- for those trees which hadn't been in place before and, and um, luckily many of the wild individuals of those trees have survived as well. Interesting. I have not heard of a captive breeding program for trees but um, I am not a botanist. But anyways that, that is all very interesting to me for sure. And as a, as a bird lover it was devastating and heartbreaking for me to hear you know, about all the birds in Australia during the bushfires that were washing up on shore from suffocating or not, not being able to fly, fly away. And so, so many of these bird species are unique to Australia. And I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, are, are birds going to be able to make a comeback? And what does the future look like for some of these birds that were affected? In fact, many of Australia's birds are unique endemic species that are not found anywhere else. And I mean, we have a like huge variety of parrots and they're, they're also, Australia's unusual in having many nectar feeding birds. We have about 800 species of eucalypts or gum trees and they, many of them produce nectar. And so here it's kind of an unusual resource that many Australian birds have evolved to benefit from and yes we have sort of many honey eaters and tree creepers and yeah all all kinds of Australia specific endemic birds and yeah you're right I mean there were very sad examples of kind of hundreds of dead parrots and honey eaters and and all kinds of other special birds that were sort of washing up in in the along the tide line on some of the beaches and we know that some birds did do 
very badly in the fires. I mean, it, the, there's a bird called the Regent Honey Eater that was, it's Australia's most threatened songbird. And it was just down to probably about 200 individuals before the fires anyway. It's a species that has done very badly since European colonization because it favoured the kind of sweetest nectar from the, the trees that were the most prolific nectar producers. But these trees only grew on the most fertile land, which was, of course, the land that has been favoured for farming and agriculture since European colonisation. So, you know, most of those trees that this species uh, needs to survive have, have gone now, and the, these migratory honey eaters have, have gone along with it. So they were already doing quite badly before the fires, but many of the places they're found in their important breeding areas were in areas that were burnt during the fires. But because they're a migratory species, it's very difficult to tell, even even to get a good population estimate. So it'll be several years before anyone has a good handle of how badly they've been impacted by the fire and the drought. But we know that there are examples of other birds in Australia that really have done much better following the fires than, than were expected. There's a beautiful, large black species of parrot, the glossy black cockatoo, which is found on Kangaroo Island in, in South Australia. And about, I think about 80% of their breeding and feeding sites were really hit very badly on Kangaroo Island during the, the fires in January. And it was thought that this was going to have a serious effect on these. But these, these birds were one of the very few species in Australia that has really made a great conservation comeback. They were critically endangered about sort of 20 years ago and through very careful you know, positioning of net box and nest boxes and planting of food trees on kangaroo island they've increased the numbers from less than 100 to kind of more than more than 300 of these birds mm -hmm. but it, it was pretty devastating in the fires because all of that conservation work over more than 20 years just had kind of gone up in flames literally so it, it, the situation looked very grim but it, but actually as it happens it species ended up being much more adaptable than people were expecting. And it managed to find food trees in kind of other parts of the island where these flocks hadn't previously been living. And, and they had quite a good fledgling season and there were a comparable number of chicks sort of born over the middle of um, the breeding, over the breeding season in the middle of 2020. And it, it really looks like that species has just been able to adapt and find a way around the problem of the fires. So, but I think it's going to be a few years and, until we're able to see the full impact on, on many species. Yeah, I can imagine. I guess only time time will tell um, with all this that's happening or has happened. And um, I, I, I want to talk about koalas a little bit. I think I would have some people upset with me if I didn't mention or ask about koalas. And um, I have a really cute promotional photo of you that was sent to me. And you are with uh, an adorable koala that I believe was rescued from the bushfires. I wonder if you could talk about that story and let our listeners know maybe a little bit what's going on with, with koalas. In fact, the, the koala in the picture was called Ember. And Ember was a joey that was brought into the Friends of the Koala Wildlife Rescue Centre in Lismore in northern New South Wales after, after those fires in kind of, I think the fires there were around September, October uh, 2019 because that's kind of in the northern part of New South Wales where the fire season kind of began. And yeah, em Ember was, there were a number of koalas that were brought into that care centre and they, they were all given fire related names, hence, hence why that little Jerry was called Ember. But she'd, she was a remarkable survivor and she I can't remember how many operations, but she'd had a huge number of operations to you know, burnt paws and, and many other problems from the fires. And but many koalas don't survive these kind of issues, but Ember had survived an enormous number of operations and really was in quite good health and was heading towards the point of being re-released to the wild when I met her. But yeah, I had that kind of incredible moment of meeting Ember and she was very curious and sort of looked deep into my eyes, which is what you can see in that photo. Uh, that is that is a good story. And I will post that photo in the show notes. It, it definitely is a good photo. And um, speaking of koalas or speaking of detection dogs that help koalas, I was wondering um, if you could share a little bit of the story I found really interesting in your book about the use of detection dogs. And I 
I believe they're scat detection dogs, if I'm correct. Um, but I believe they're helping conservationists now track and number uh, koalas and helping with determining what what numbers of koalas are out there. They Take note. started off scat detection dogs. So yeah, this is a really fantastic program that um, has been developed at the University of the Sunshine Coast in Australia. And I think starting in about 20, 2012 or kind of maybe about eight years ago, they'd been training some of these Australian, they're kind of Australian working dogs called coolies. And they, they look a bit like a, a kind of sheepdog, but it's an Australian breed of dog. And so they're working dogs that are very high energy. And they've trained these dogs to um, sniff out endangered species and and then they've also trained them to not hurt or attack any if they do run into any of these animals too so i mean the problem is that many species in australia that that we're interested in conserving are very well very cryptic and very well hidden in their environments and they're hard to find so it's different koalas particularly like even trained human spotters of koalas miss about 50 percent of them because they're difficult to spot in the trees so they, they train these detection dogs to go out with ecologists to do wildlife surveys. And, you know, if a patch of land was being considered for development, there has to be an ecological survey to see what the impact of that development is. And they could go in and do a survey and see if they were endangered species in these places that might mean that they were protected from development. So, I mean, originally they were scat dogs, but actually Bear, the dog that I talk about in the story, he had been trained to detect the smell of koalas themselves, not necessarily their scats. And really this skill came into its own after the fire because koalas are so hard to find in the trees and what was happening in in the fire grounds after fires passed through was there were injured koalas up in the trees and people weren't finding them. and, And if they didn't get medical care, they'd almost certainly die. So over the course of the, I mean, really, I think Bear was out searching for koalas for kind of five months or something from December, along with his um, handlers, the scientists at the university. And I I think he found about 100 koalas over that time. And if they found koalas, they would try to coax them down out of the trees and then get them into medical care or a care center where they could have their wounds treated and then just be kind of fed up again. Because, of course, in these environments, once the fires have passed through, the, you know, the trees have been burnt, there was, there was no moisture, there was nothing for the koalas to eat. So, yeah, it was kind of remarkable that Bear was sent out and, you know, he'd run around, scamper around excitedly. And then, you know, if you found a koala, he would sit or lie down under that tree, kind of wagging his tail. And, it, and that would tell the scientists that there was a, probably a koala above him in the tree. Oh, I, I love hearing stories like that. And that just made me think of a question. Uh, what what does the food source look like now for koalas since the bushfires? You know, are are there plants and trees coming back enough where they can eat or or live? Things couldn't look more different in Australia. You know, we're just coming. We're at the end of well, we've just passed the end of summer. Really heading into our winter now. But over this summer, yeah, it, everything is sort of green and vibrant. And there's a climatic one. One of the main sort of drivers of the climate each year in Australia is called the El Nino Southern System. And it, it's all to do with the ocean currents across the Pacific and, and the way that moisture travels across the Pacific. So this year it flipped into what's called the La Nina, where actually draws moisture across the Pacific from, from South America to Australia. It really means that we've had a very wet summer, it's just been consistent rain, certainly in Sydney, consistent rain nearly every week right across the summer and heavy heavy rain as well flooding but it has meant that you know a lot of trees a lot of environment have come back so there's certainly a lot of foliage on on the the eucalypts that were not killed by the intensity of the fires those eucalypts that survived are making a good effort to try and recover now and yeah and i know uh before you mentioned when we were talking that you know, people are becoming more aware of what changes to be made. But are you seeing overall that people are have learned lessons from the fires after they happened? And so so maybe they don't happen on such a large scale again, or they're more prepared, or maybe more rescue plans in place? Well, I mean, there's a number of points in the answer to that question, really. I mean, for a start, I would say, you know, 
we went straight from the bushfire crisis. The fires were extinguished around February, March. And then, of course, almost immediately afterwards, we went into the pandemic and the lockdowns. And so, and you know, sadly, the obviously the pandemic has been a huge disaster and it's really drawn people's, that and the fact we've had such a wet summer this year, I think a lot of the public really probably has started to forget about the incredible impact of the bushfire crisis. But certainly scientists, park rangers and state governments have, have not forgotten in Australia and they're thinking now about what, what we need to do next time this rolls around again and unfortunately i would say there's almost nothing we can do to stop fires of this intensity happening in australia again because there are a number of climate driven factors that were absolutely responsible for what happened i mean one was this unprecedented drought that were you know was three years of drought really in a lot of parts of southeastern australia and that combined with many years of, you know, just heat records tumbling constantly, had just absolutely sucked all of the moisture out of the environment, out of the trees. So in fact, wildlife in Australia was already really suffering from the drought even before the bushfires arrived. But, you know, as temperatures continue to rise, drought, droughts, Australia has a constant cycle of drought and flood. And, you know, so maybe every 30 years, there's, there's a very severe drought that may run for several years and it's often followed again by flooding rains and that cycle goes backwards and forwards and but what's happening now with as the climate gets warmer is the, the droughts are getting more and more severe they're covering a larger and larger area and they're lasting longer than ever before and then concurrently temperatures are you know inching ever higher to the point where in the 2019 2020 season we hit a sudden tipping point where these enormous fires just you know there was fuel in many environments that was available to burn that wouldn't normally be in the fires spread over a much greater extent than they have before. And, and because the climate is continuing to rise and until we can limit our greenhouse gas emissions and um, mitigate the effects of rising temperatures, there's almost no doubt that very severe fires will return next time we have a bad drought in Australia. So you know they may be five years away, it may be 10, it may be 20, but they they are coming back again. And the, the wider public may have forgotten about this, but scientists, you know, scientists and park rangers haven't forgotten about this. And they, we, we were very poorly prepared in terms of protecting important species and important environments last time, I think, because nobody had predicted quite the scale of what we experienced. Certainly not, you know, it was thought to be an effect that was going to happen further in the future with climate change nobody was expecting sort of a catastrophe on that scale right. but now it's happened Pe people know that it could come around again and they're thinking about some of the things we could do they, they you know similar to what the rescue effort or the firefighting effort with the wall of my pine many i mean all critically endangered species in the areas that could burn need to have similar plans in place now or they need to have rescue efforts where researchers will go in and you know potentially scoop up individuals into a captive breeding program if fire is almost certainly going to pass through and, and there needs to be a change in in the legislation in australia that brings wildlife and ecosystems under the purview of firefighters you know state firefighting initiatives because at the moment firefighting resources are really focused on saving human lives and property and of course that's right but there are many precious ecological assets that we need to be prioritizing to save in the face of fires like this in the future and also we need to be thinking about carving fire breaks around some of these environments in the same way that fire breaks are carved around human settlements right. i mean in the fight in the 2019 2020 bushfire crisis there very few people lost their lives there was really uh, i mean uh, People did tragically lose their lives, but it was around 35 people. It could have been many more. Yeah, but you, you know, some of those efforts to save human lives and um, property were successful. So there's a possibility to think more carefully about kind of carving out fire breaks around other species and environments too. So, I mean, they're, they're just some of the things that people need to think about before these fires roll around again. Yeah, I agree. These are some points that we really need to uh, be aware of as well. Uh, here in California, we had a, a terrible summer as well last year with fire and 
and we need to learn some of these lessons. But um, I, I, I wanted to tell you I really enjoyed your book and thank you so much for writing it. And I also wanted to share with you, it did give me some hope just knowing that there are so many people out there that care and, and they, they put so much into saving you know, animals and plants and trees and such, you know, they're dedicating their lives and risking their lives to do this. So I really do appreciate you sharing their story. I'm really I'm happy to uh, hear that you got back from it and that you enjoyed reading the book. Definitely. And um, I want to be mindful of your time as well. And my last question to everyone in, in these interviews is, um, you know, I ask, you know, what gives you hope? I, you know, what, what I tried to do in the book was sort of paint a bit of a hopeful future and, and make the point that it's not too late, that there are many dedicated people out there that are doing everything they can to conserve our environments and, and make a difference for the future. But really, I would say, you know, for your listeners, the biggest step that people can take to secure our, um, not only secure our environment, but in secure our own lifestyle a way of life our, our future is to vote for politicians who support strong action on on climate change because that's the biggest thing that we're going to be able to do to help us transition to a much greener future and greener economies and, and a less polluted and more environmentally friendly lifestyle that you know we can all enjoy well this ends today's episode thank you for listening everyone and i am marcia civic with be provided conservation radio thank you john pickrell for your new book flames of extinction the race to save australia's threatened wildlife and this book is published by island press and can be found on islandpress.org and It also became available for purchase in the U.S. wherever you buy your books on April 15th, 2021. John is also the author of Flying Dinosaurs and Weird Dinosaurs and is the former editor of Australian Geographic magazine. He currently is the Asia Pacific Bureau Chief for Nature and he has worked in London, Washington, D.C. and Sydney for publications including New Scientist, Science, Science News, and Cosmos. And his articles also appear in Nature, National Geographic, Scientific American, Focus, BBC Future, The Guardian, and ABC. Also, please check out islandpress.org for other interesting books and authors that are working to protect our environment. And today's show notes will be on my website at www.beprovided.com and they will include photographs of John's book cover as well as that picture of John and Ember the koala. If you want to hear more stories like this, please subscribe to our newsletter also found at www.beprovided.com. So thank you everyone. Thank you for listening. Stay safe and stay healthy.